welcome everybody to another Crosstalk live stream. It's been just under two months since I did the last one. A lot has changed since then. Let me crank down this music. Check, 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 check two, check two. Welcome everybody. Looks like some folks are starting to pile into the chat. Let's take a look here. Desktop. There we go. Music's still going, FYI. Thank you, Michael. Everything has been turned down. We should be good to go. Hopefully the audio levels are okay. And as always, if I am screwing anything up, please tell me in the chat. I know you will. <laughs> uh, okay, so I wanted to do a live stream. Uh, live stream, excuse me. I don't know how long I'm gonna go. Maybe an hour, maybe two hours, maybe an hour and 43 minutes. I'm not exactly sure. We will just have to see uh, how it goes. Uh, audio is okay. Well, thank you, Kashi. I appreciate that. Chris for president. Oh, God, no. I do not want that responsibility. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, all right, so let's see. Jonathan, welcome. Ramus, welcome. Erasmus, welcome. All is fine. Thank you very much, you guys. Okay, so I'm going to get into detail about this a little bit later, but I am planning in this live stream... It's weird, when I have my headphones on, I can't hear myself. I'm gonna take these down, there we go. In my live stream here, I am going to be attempting, attempting for the first time ever on this live stream to take some phone calls from you guys. So uh, it may go horribly wrong, I don't know. Uh, we'll just have to see how it works. And I will give you all of the details about how you can call in and ask some questions, that sort of stuff. and. I think it would make um, for some interesting content. Um, you know, get your questions, I'll answer them to the best of my ability, or if you just wanna chat and say hi, that is okay too. So, how could it go horribly wrong? The audio might be terrible, I don't know how that's gonna work. Um, no one could call, there's another problem that might happen, we'll see, uh, so it'll be, yeah, it'll be interesting. Okay, so uh, a couple things before we get to that, and I will give you guys all the rules for how to call in and that sort of stuff in just a moment, uh, but um, I did want to take care of a little bit of business right up front. First things first, we've had a pretty good uh, amount of uptake on our Discord channel, so I wanted to make sure that you guys are all aware of the Discord channel. I have a new Discord link for joining the channel. The link is down below in the description, but it is HTTPS colon slash slash crosstalk, no, https colon slash slash discord.io slash crosstalk. Okay, so very easy. If you guys want to join the Discord, we got a lot of great people on there helping each other out with Ubiquity stuff, helping each other out with free PBX stuff, and uh, I'm on there all the time as well if you ever want to ask me a question or say hi. I don't always get back to everyone who asks me a question, and especially those people that uh, you know ping me at three o'clock in the morning when I'm sleeping. <laughs> I definitely don't get back to those people, uh, but uh, I will participate and answer questions and stuff where I can. Uh, oh yes, thanks for the XG6 coverage. Yes. Uh, well, they say they want 500 for that XG6. I can neither confirm nor deny because I am specifically not allowed to talk about anything that goes on in the early access store with Ubiquity. So $500, I don't know anything about it. So there you go. Uh, okay, so the second thing that I wanted to mention uh, is that if you guys have not already gotten your Crosstalk t-shirt, the Rock Your Network acoustic or electric t-shirt, boom, there you go. You can pick that up at the link in the description below. This one is the acoustic version. You can see it's a RJ45 over here, an access point, some Wi-Fi, some uh, actually uh, correctly wired Cat5 cabling for the strings of the guitar. And uh, if you guys use the coupon code LIVESTREAM, all one word, all uppercase, LIVESTREAM, again, that information is down in the description below. That gets you 10% off your order, and it only works for the duration of this live stream. So if you're interested in buying one of those shirts, all proceeds go to me. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, yes, uh, A. Malek says, can we put questions on here? Yes, you certainly can. However, when I'm taking phone calls, the phone calls will take precedence over anything that's happening in chat. Uh, okay, so I also wanted to bring up, and this is really cool, something that I'm super, super excited about. 
Um, let me see, what view am I looking for? This one here. Okay, so there's the t-shirts at teespring.com, but, uh, whoa, that's a, I stopped on a terrible screenshot of myself. Um, you will guys notice here, let me put this into this mode here, theater mode. Um, you will notice that now, as of today, and, you know, starting today, I should say, on my free PBX 14 series, there are now closed captioning. Okay, so I have paid to have subtitles put on all of the free PBX videos. That's going to help people who are watching this and they, you know, absorb information better if they are reading versus just listening to me talk. You might miss something if you're just listening to me. And with the subtitles, that's going to make everything a lot better for people that are trying to set up free PBX. I'm going to do this probably for some of my um, more important or more popular videos starting from here and moving forward. Uh, but as you can see... Welcome to Crosstalk you. Solutions. My name's Chris there and this go. is Free so PBX 101 for Free PBX version of 14. This is the second video in our series where we're going to go through videos. the initial um, setup These are also wizard great for, for people free that are, you know, English is a Just second a quick language. Maybe I speak too quickly for you and it would be better for you to actually read what I'm saying as opposed to um, you know, just, just listening to, to my dumb mouth talk. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> Kashi writes, what's your channel is really about? Please reply. I'm watching for the first time. <laughs> How do you even find the channel and watch it if you don't know what the channel is about? I don't know. Uh, okay. So, let us go back to this other view. We're going to go back to my chat view here. Okay, so now let's talk about um, let's talk about telephone calls. And there's a lot of stuff to talk about. I did just get back from Wispa Palooza last week, so we can talk about any of the new stuff that uh, happened with Wispa Palooza last week. We can talk about the new products coming from um, Ubiquity. I am not allowed to talk about any early access stuff. Uh, I got my wrist slapped for that by Ubiquity last time I did a live stream, uh, so we're not going to do that. And uh, let's see, what else? Um, just lots of exciting stuff uh, happening right now. So the phone calls that I am hoping to take here, um, the, there's a couple rules. Number one rule is, of course, don't be a dickhead, right? If you're going to call in, you know, be cordial, be nice. It's okay to be critical, but don't be a dickhead, okay? If you're a dickhead, I'm going to hang up on you. Uh, number two rule, this is not tech support. Okay, so I don't want calls about tech support. If you're calling with the tech support question, I'm going to hang up on you. Okay, so so then what is available, right? So if you want general discussion about anything happening in the networking industry, anything happening in the voice over IP industry, we can talk about that. If you want career advice, I have hired and fired more people than I can count, and I've also had a number of jobs through the years. I'm happy to talk about your career and give you career advice if that is something that you're interested in, or just general discussion um, whatever. Okay. So, um, why don't we try to take a phone call and see how it goes? Again, I don't know exactly how this is going to go. I think it's going to be okay, but here we go. Okay. So phone calls. Oops. I didn't assign a, uh, shortcut to it. So boom, there we go. Okay. So the other thing, get to the point, <laughs> right? No one wants to listen to you stammer on about stuff. Uh, get to the point. Um, no tech support calls, general discussion, questions, and career advice only. We're going to leave this number up on the screen, and we will see if anyone actually bothers to call in. Who's going to be the first person to call Crosstalk on a live stream? We will see. In the meantime, um, I will uh, answer some questions in the chat here. I don't like this big picture of my face here, so I'm going to change that. <laughs> put it on my my t-shirt store. I don't like myself staring at myself on this screen. <clears throat> firing people is tough for me. So knowledge X, firing people is tough for me. Any tips? Uh, we do have a call coming in from uh, 619 area code. I'll get that in one second. Let me ask you this question first though. Firing people is tough for me. Any tips? The, the best tip I can give you as far as firing people goes uh, is just rip the band-aid. Okay, don't delay it. Don't him ha around it. Don't dance around the subject. Get to it. Get the firing done and be over with it because it's just as awkward for the person being fired uh, as it is for the person doing the firing. It's a very uncomfortable situation. So get it over and done with quickly. And uh, you don't always have to be 
super specific about the reason that you're firing someone. Now, um, certainly there should be justification for firing someone. You're not really allowed to just fire people willy-nilly or based on race or you know religion or anything like that, right? There should be a reason for firing someone or laying someone off. Um, you don't always have to get into specifics. And I think most HR teams around the world would agree that it's not necessarily a good idea to get too specific when you are actually firing someone. Okay, so let's take a phone call. This is from the 6, 619 area code. Hello, uh, who are you? Hi, Sean from San Diego. Hey, Sean, how are you doing? What can I do for you? And also, anyone on the live stream, let me know if you can't hear Sean. Uh, because I will try to fix that live here. Go ahead, Sean. So, um, you know, the main thing that's been on my mind recently is this uh, Unify Video versus Unify Protect. Sure. Um, I, I just installed a, my first large camera installation, 46 cameras, um, and, you know, I just want to make sure that that software is going to be supported. Um, it's on a, a Dell server, um, which I chose a Dell server um, with Windows Server because I could get the Windows Server license for pretty cheap because uh, it, it's for a nonprofit. So I got Windows Server, you know, I think for 50 bucks or something sure. on TechSoup. Um, and I'm more f familiar with Windows. And so I set that up on a I, – I, afterwards, I realized that the server was kind of overkill. Um, but um, it should work great now for them. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I'm just concerned and – I don't know if you've played around with uh, Protect, but I've heard that you couldn't put it on your own hardware. And yeah, so... good question. And, and actually, that's a big sort of hot topic that's happened. I've been asked to comment on this a lot. Um, so here's the deal. And for anyone who's not familiar with what Sean is talking about, um, basically, Unify, or I should say um, Ubiquity, came out with a statement on, I think it was on Reddit originally. And the statement that they came out with said that, listen, Unify Protect is going to be for Ubiquity hardware only. Okay, and so people got super pissed off about that because Unify Video, which everyone thought was just like the predecessor to Unify Protect, um, Unify Video, you are allowed to install it on any such server that you want, such as the crosstalk NVR servers that I sell, such as the Dell server that Sean is using. Even though it's overkill, it doesn't matter. It's better overkill than underkill, right? So, um, And so people got super pissed off about that because Ubiquity is kind of taking away the ability to install on your own hardware. And that is, it sort of opens up Unify Protect to a couple of problems. Um, I guess problems depending on who's who you're looking at. From Ubiquity's point of view, it probably solves a lot of problems because they can manage the hardware that their product is being installed onto, and therefore it's a lot easier for them to, as far as support of that product, um, if you can manage the hardware. I mean, think of the Apple model of how things are done. That's kind of um, what we're looking at here. And you know, coincidentally, Robert Para came from Apple, right? So maybe there's some, some sort of uh, a link there. Um, the other, the problem though for users such as myself is that it had been promised all along that you, Unify Protect was going to be the next version of Unify Video. And there are some things in Unify Protect that were promised to be better than Unify Video, such as the motion detection algorithms, right? So with Unify Video, there's a lot of problems with um, false positives and stuff like that where supposedly the motion detection in Protect is a lot better. Um, so that's a problem. And then a lot of people also think, well, they're very similar products. I mean, you've got cameras in Protect, you've got cameras in Unify Video. What's the difference and why are we shifting? Why are we having two separate products now? Um, the notion that they, you know, I guess in my mind, they changed the name to Unify Protect probably because they're going to eventually come out with additional hardware that's not just cameras, right? And probably something to do with home automation or something to do with um, home security, maybe motion detectors or door sensors or window break, you know, glass break sensors or something. I don't know. I'm just speculating. But um, so that's cool. I love that. Except again, if you can't install on third party hardware, that's a problem. Um, another problem with not being able to install on third party hardware is that you are going to be they, they don't have hardware available today that is good for much more than about 20 cameras. So again, Sean, you said that your install was what, 46 cameras? 
Yeah, like 46 cameras. Uh, a few of those will be the pro, the pro cameras. Yeah. So, so G3 cameras, pro cameras, 46 cameras. You, you certainly can't put 46 cameras on the Cloud Key Gen 2 Plus. It just doesn't have the hardware, nor does it have features that you would need for 46 cameras, such as a lot of hard drive space and um, redundancy in the hard drives. Like if I was doing 46 cameras, I'd probably be doing like a 20 to 30 gigabyte RAID 10 array. You don't have that option with either the Cloud Key Gen 2, uh, Cloud Key Plus Gen 2, or the Unify application server. Uh, maybe someone might know in the comments or uh, in the in the chat. Can you do RAID with the Unify application server? I don't remember if that's the case or not. Um, I don't think, I think it's the case. Isn't there two drives in that unit? There might be, uh, and, and, and maybe I'm mistaken about that. But if there are two drives, that's great that you can do RAID. However, again, you're now limited to the drives that you can actually put in that device, right? So you can't go more than, you know, if, if it accepts 10 terabyte drives, you wouldn't be able to have more than a RAID 1 10 terabyte set of drives in there, right? So I literally just, yeah, and just this week built of... one that is 6 by 10 RAID 10. Right, so the demand is there for that stuff, and and Ubiquity might be coming out with a bigger server that allows you to put in bigger hard drives for Protect. But again, that's total speculation. I I don't know if they're doing that or not. I I would hope they they do at some point. Yeah, one more quick question, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I'm a IT consultant, um, and I'm wondering how you know how are you charging your clients? I'm sure it's I'm sure it's some things. Um, sometimes they charge project based, other times it's hourly. And then I'm wondering, do you charge any clients monthly for services? Um, I've actually stayed away from charging clients monthly because I've seen a lot of people getting taken advantage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these IT firms charging 500 a month and they don't do anything. Yep. Um, and so I I didn't and never want to be that kind of person that's you know getting paid for not doing work and so I steered away from that. Um, but at the same time, you know, hosting cloud servers and stuff like that, um, I try to make up for those costs, but I'm almost thinking, does it make sense to charge someone $50 a month, um, for networking, monitoring, something like that? What are your thoughts? So, yeah, I am actually in the same camp that you are, right? So we charge a number of ways. We charge hourly. Um, and actually, we don't even charge hourly so much as we now sell blocks of hours. So with Crosstalk, you can buy a two-hour block of hours. You can buy a 10-hour block of hours. Um, if you buy the 10-hour block of hours, you get a 10% discount, and those hours are good for a year. Um, that's kind of the model that has been working for us. We also certainly do per-project pricing where the labor of anything is built into the cost of an NVR or a phone system or whatever we happen to be selling. Um, I am also not a fan of the monthly managed service fee because of a number of reasons. Uh, number one, I just don't have the staff to be available 24-7 uh, where if someone is paying me $500 a month to manage their network and it goes down at 10 p.m. on Christmas Eve, they're going to expect me to be there managing their network, right? And I don't want that responsibility. I don't want to have to do that. Um, and I don't want to let a customer down because of something like that. Um, I also, like you, I feel very bad about charging customers for services that they don't, uh, they don't use. I would just prefer that they pay me hourly and, um, you know, every hour that they pay me is an hour that they actually were able to receive the benefit from. Um, so yeah, great question. And, uh, and that's the way it works. Well, great. Thank you very much. All right, Sean, thanks for calling, and congratulations on being the first caller ever to a Crosstalk live stream. All right, have a good one, man. Nice, thanks, bye. Okay, hey, that didn't go so bad. All right, guys, well, I don't have any other callers lined up, so if anyone wants to call in, you're more than welcome to call in. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to start answering some questions over here in the chat. I wonder if I can drag this over here. Oh, hey, we got another call. Hang on a second. Look at that. All right. This call is coming in from the 502 area code. It's from the credit card. For 502, whoa. 502 area code. <laughs> How's it going? Did he hang up? Oh, he called in and then hung up. I heard him for a split second. All right. 
take that back down. All right, phone calls are still open. Thanks for taking my call. Yeah, no problem, Sean. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. Someone's responding to someone else. Oh, here we go. 512 area code. Let's grab this call. And another call came in from 541. Oh, that's pretty local. I will have to uh, check that one out next. Stay on the line, 541. We're talking to 512. Who are you and what can I do for you? Hi, this is Umesh Kumar. I, um, I just started with the Ubiquiti um, you know, network at my home. Just sure. put uh, some six access points, a 48-port uh, switch in my rack in the basement, um, and then um, I have Control 4, which I have from 2010. So I have a good size network at home, and it was important to have a reliable network. That's why I switched to Ubiquiti instead of sure. using home um, kind of modem. Now, you know, I do want to experiment or use the Ubiquiti VoIP phone. Um, and, I, you know, for a home use, I don't have any extension. I do like to have a, a solid phone for my home office. What would you suggest? Is there any cloud provider like Uma or Google Voice that I can directly use the SIP um, and use it? Or what's, you know, yeah. is free PBX the way to go? So a couple of things there. I, no, you don't need free PBX for something like that. So he's, he's asking basically, um, I've got one extension at home or I just want one extension at home and I want to be able to send or receive phone calls. Do you have anything more fancy? Like are you looking for an automated attendant or anything like that? Or you just want to be able to send and receive calls? Just send and receive call for now. Automated sure. attendant um, at some point may make sense, but not at this point, not okay. in the near future. So honestly, what I would recommend, uh, and, and one of the most cost-effective ways of doing what you're asking to do is just get with a SIP provider such as FlowRoute. Um, FlowRoute is good because they're a pay-as-you-go. They're not like a monthly commitment. They don't charge you monthly like 35 bucks a month or something for the line. They just, you know, you plunk like $25, $30 of credit into their account and then you just get, you know, you just use that credit at like one point whatever cents per minute, uh, you know, for calls uh, in and out. Um, you can connect a FlowRoute account directly to pretty much any SIP phone, including the Unify phones. Um, however, I probably personally would not recommend the Unify video phones. Um, I just think, I mean, they look great, but they don't, they were not implemented well, in my opinion. Um, they, uh, the Android operating system's a little sluggish due to the, you know, I think there's a little bit underpowered as far as the CPU in those phones. It doesn't look like there's a lot of ongoing development of the Unify VoIP product. Uh, and in addition, I'm not sure, it's been about two years since I've looked at those phones, but when I last looked at those phones, um, you you were able to log, they're, they're Android based. So you have to log in with like a Google, a Gmail account to those phones in order to get your contacts and stuff like that. However, there was no way to actually lock the phone. You could not secure the phone in any way. So in like a business environment, if you had a bunch of those phones and everyone had their Gmail accounts connected so they could use their contacts, anyone else could walk by and get right into someone's contacts, get right into someone's email. And you know, through the interface of the phone, they could do a lot of stuff that you probably wouldn't want them doing with your Google account. Um, that may not matter as much for a home user, uh, but, you know, it's something to take into consideration. If you're looking for a nice phone, um, I would probably maybe recommend something like uh, one of the new Yealink phones, like the Yealink T5 series. Um, T58, or let's see, Yealink T5X. Let's see what we can see here. T5 series phones from Yealink are actually pretty pretty nice. So you've got like these big screens if you want the big ones. Uh, the smaller ones even have nice uh, nice screens as well, like this T54. Um, so this will do everything that you want it to do. It, this is also overkill for home. Um, if you just want a phone that can do, you know, a call in and out, this is certainly overkill, but, um, you know, it, it's more on par with the Unify video, but a lot more functional. And um, gotcha. it will translate to free PBX later a lot better if you eventually do want to go with free PBX. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate uh, all the content that I have consumed while installing, um, you know, uh, the Ubiquiti and even learning about Ubiquiti um, and getting enamored uh, by all the 
um, all the functionalities that you have showcased over the years. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's super, super easy to go down that uh, Ubiquity rabbit hole. <laughs> Believe me, I've got a box full of Ubiquity stuff sitting in my closet, and uh, I you know, I test it out and use it sometimes for the most part. It just sits there because I like it and I just want to play with the ubiquity stuff. All right, taking another call from my own area code, 541 area code. All right, 541 area code, who are you and what can I do for you? Yes, sir, this is Mike. I'm a, I am a little bit south of you. Um, I was actually going to post this question on one of your other videos to get an answer, but since you're taking phone calls, I figured I'd, I'd jump on here and ask. Sure, um, I, I'm I'm considering doing a, uh, a roaming tech sort of gig going around and, and fixing some issues, um, you know, a fairly, fairly specific niche. But um, a question came up as I was polling for the need for this service. Uh, someone asked me, uh, are you, am I licensed and bonded and insured? Um, I guess my question is, is um, what sort of things can I do without licensing and bonding insurance or do I even need to factor that in? Um, and, and what is your experience with that, Ben? Sure. So two, there's, those are sort of two separate questions, right? What do you need in terms of licensing and bonding? And what do you need in terms of insurance? Um, so for me personally, uh, there was a type of insurance that I had to get that I was totally unaware of when I started consulting. Um, and that is what's called errors and omissions or E and O insurance. Now, E and O is basically like if you go into someone's network and you start fiddling with things they've hired you to you know install a server or do whatever replace the firewall who knows what and if you screw something up so bad that it costs them a lot of money in terms of repairing it or just downtime and they you know like maybe it was a car dealership and they were down for two days so they couldn't sell cars for those two days um e and o insurance protects you from that type of thing errors and omissions right so i would highly recommend it it's not expensive i think my policy is like about 500 dollars a year uh, for the e and o coverage so it's not that expensive uh, when you factor it out you know over the month um, the other type of insurance that i have is insurance for loss of product right so basically theft or like if i'm shipping something somewhere and the shipment gets lost i mean we are shipping you know tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment around the country on a regular basis. Maybe this doesn't you know, matter as much if you're not doing nationwide service, but it still could matter. Like if someone delivered uh, a whole bunch of equipment to your front door and someone stole it off your doorstep, right? You would, uh, the, the, the sort of theft insurance or general you know, loss insurance covers you for that. Uh, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Uh, the other thing, so on the licensing and bonding, um, the only thing, it really depends on what you're actually doing, right? So for instance, if you are going to be doing a lot of cabling installs, then you definitely need to be licensed for low voltage cabling. However, it, if you've looked up what it takes to get licensed for low voltage cabling, it takes a lot of effort and time, including like some number of hours I, i'm sure it varies state by state but you have to be an apprentice of an electrician in low voltage cabling for like 1500 hours or something i don't know what the exact number is but it's a it's a ridiculous yeah, low voltage you're basically you're basically becoming an electrician at that point uh, yeah i mean it's to run cat 5 cabling so not necessarily like you're dealing with a lot of heavy duty electric electrical stuff but um you know it, it is definitely you know something that you should be certified for if you're going to be doing large jobs. Now, I am not certified in low voltage cabling. If I have a big cabling job, I sub that out to local electricians that I work with and I know can do a good job. And then I just pass that cost directly on to the, you know, the customer that's paying for that service. For like one cable run, if I just have to install one access point and I'm running one cable up a wall and, you know, plugging it into an access point, for that stuff, I'll pretty much just do it myself. Uh, but if it was a big cabling job where I'm having to drill through walls or go up and down levels of a building, then I absolutely sub all of that out. Well, I'm, I'm more targeting the, the smaller uh, residential places and, and, and perhaps some small businesses. So, uh, you know, maybe a, a few, you know, three or four cable runs, something like that, um, you know, is, is kind of 
kind of going to be the top end of what I'm considering. Sure. Well, and, and again, the there's there's the level there, there's the risk versus reward, right? So, like for instance, I was at Wispapalooza last week, and while I was at Wispapalooza, there was a gentleman that I ran into that uh, owns a Wisp, and he had had a uh, he had had one of his guys, like one of his installers, go out to a client's house, and they installed a um, you know an antenna on the roof of the house, and they had run the cable right over the lip of the sort of roof line, and in the wind that cable was rubbing against just a piece of wood. Basically, they didn't put in a service loop, and so essentially what happened is the cable eventually wore through and um, ignited. It actually started a little bit of a fire. Luckily, the fire that it started was on concrete, so it didn't actually burn anything up or cause any problem other than a little bit of discoloration of the concrete. But had that been like a rug or carpet or something like that, it could have very well caused a fire that would have been bad enough to maybe burn someone's house down, right? So... I, again, it's it's risk versus reward. If you're running three or four lines around someone's house, the the risk is very low, but there is still some risk involved. So it's really what's your level of comfortability. And for me personally, giving you advice, I would say hire, uh, uh, you know, getting good with a local electrician that can do those jobs, even maybe someone working on the side, but they're still licensed, right? Um, and then at least you're covered in that regard. Okay. Um, thanks a lot for all the ubiquity coverage. I'm, sure. I'm a big fan of theirs. I use it at my at, at where I work in my day job as well as my own businesses. All right. Well, yeah, absolutely. No problem. And thank you so much for calling. Appreciate the call. Okay, there we go. All right. Wonderful. Hey, look, that's three phone calls in a row that went relatively well. So <laughs> thank you guys for that. I'm going to put up the phone calls uh, screen again. If you guys want to call in, go ahead and call in. In the meantime, I'm going to answer some more of these uh, questions here. So here we have uh, Kashi is asking, can we hack our ISP? <laughs> uh, the answer to that is no, you cannot hack your ISP. I mean, my advice to you would be no, do not hack your ISP. Let's put it that way. Uh, let's see, perhaps a live stream deal on phones. So that's a good question. We do have another caller coming in. I will pick that up in just one second. Uh, but I did want to talk about this. So a live stream deal on phones. So I've been working with a number of uh, vendors lately. And the vendors that I've been working with, um, I have been pressuring every single one of them to do, to give me stuff to do giveaways on the channel. Okay, so... I'm working on it, guys. Like I, I really don't want to work with vendors anymore unless they're giving me something that I can give away to you because that's uh, it's sort of a win-win. Like someone in the audience could win something, and it also gets me more views because if there's a contest going on in conjunction with something that I'm talking about, you know, it just makes for better content uh, or more views on the channel. Um, okay, so let's answer this call. We have a call coming in from the four nine one area code. Uh, what's your name? What can I do for you? Hi, this is Thomas, and uh, it's the area code is 49 for Germany. So oh, I'm calling from for Germany. Germany. Call this is our first international call, is that what you're saying? Exactly. All right, well, welcome to the yeah. channel. Appreciate uh, it. Yeah, I only wanted to say thank you. I was also surprised to see a German product on your channel when you tested the German cable tester. Yeah, the pocket, but, Ethernet. Uh, I, the pocket Ethernet. I love that thing. Exactly, exactly. And yeah, I really enjoy all the networking stuff. It's very informative and I really love your channel. So please keep up the good stuff. All right. Well, Thomas, thank you so much. I appreciate the call all the way from Germany. That is awesome. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. That's great. It's funny. I actually have, um, for some reason, a disproportionate amount of viewers in the sort of that area of the country, like the Netherlands, Denmark, Germany, like uh, and, and one of these days, I really hope to get out there and visit because it's just a beautiful part of the country, a uh, beautiful part of the world, excuse me. And um, yeah, I'd love to take my family out there. And if I do ever take my family out there, I'm hitting all of you guys up because I'm sure some of you owe me beers. And I know the beers out there are very, very, very good. So there we go. Sweden, Netherlands. See, everyone's checking in right now. See? 
<laughs> All right, Barcelona, Spain. I wouldn't consider Spain part of that same exact part of the country, but uh, welcome anyways, Sergi. Portugal. Wow. See, look, all these places. Everyone's checking in from all these different places. It's just It just astounds me. How many people we even got on this live stream right now? Let me check. Uh, we're looking at 167 people watching this live stream right now. So awesome. Thank you to everyone from around the world that is watching the Crosstalk live stream. Um, okay, so we'll wait for more phone calls to roll in. In the meantime, let me see if I can get to some of these questions in the chat. Let me pull this over one more time. Uh, let's see. Just Sandy says, I'm trying to set up a wireless bridge with a M.2. I need to know how to whoop, hook it up to get into the website to configure it. Okay, so very easy with all of the Rocket M or Nanostation M products. You basically have to take your laptop. Do I have a laptop? I don't have a laptop with an easy reach. So I was going to use it as a prop, but I guess I'm not going to be able to do that. You have to take your laptop and you have to manually configure your laptop into the 192.168.1.x network. So basically edit the properties of your network card, 192.168.1.anything other than 1 or 20. So like say 192.168.1.2 is going to work perfectly fine. Set your subnet to 255, 255, 255, 0. And then take a network cable, plug it into the network port of that laptop, and then plug the other end of that cable into your Nanostation M2 and then open up your browser to 192.168.1.20. That is the default IP address for any of the Nanostation, NanoBeam, Nano whatever devices, okay? It should pop up the it should pop up the interface at that point. If it doesn't, then you need to factory reset that nanostation because it might have been changed to some other IP address or something. After you factory reset it by holding in the reset button while the power is on for about 15 seconds, once it factory resets, you should be able to get into 192.168.1.20. One other thing I will say about the nanostations is that some of the newer nanostations, such as the nanostation ACs, have a separate management radio built in, which means you can use your phone and the, I guess it's the UNMS app on the phone to configure them through that separate management radio. And they're coming out with more and more devices that have separate management radios. Uh, okay, hopefully that answers your question. All right, uh, Peter Litvinchuk asks, hi, thanks for your videos, I have a question for you. Can you please make a video like you did Edge Router and unify AP, but using PFSense and access point. So that's a really good question. Um, I am not that familiar with PFSense. It's just on my long list of to-do items to sort of learn PFSense. Um, and if I ever do learn PFSense, and if I decide to start doing videos on PFSense, we did a few PFSense videos on the channel, but it was Andy. It was my guy Andy out in Texas that actually did those videos. So if I ever pick up the reins and start doing PFSense videos, then I will absolutely 100% um, show you how to do VLANs with uh, access point. Because I think that's one of the most common things that people ask for is, hey, how do I do a PFSense or whatever router I need two VLANs, one for my regular traffic, one for a guest network, and how do you set all of that up with an access point? And I can absolutely uh, do that. Okay, uh, let's see. Who else has a question here? Oh, Alexander says he will get me a beer when I'm in the Netherlands. Thank you very much for that. It looks like we got a call coming in. Let me grab this call. Hold on one second here. All right, call coming in from the 716 area code. Welcome to the channel. Who are you? What can I do for you? Hey, good evening. Uh, good evening. Well, depending where you're at, I'm <laughs> calling you from Istanbul, Turkey. All right, but, uh, Istanbul. I have a network. Yeah, um, you guys. You guys have I been have in. The, a... You guys have been in the news a lot lately, huh? Yeah, I'm actually from the states. I just happen to be working here. Oh, gotcha. Okay, um, excellent. So uh, again, I, Chris, I appreciate your channel. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, I have a quick question for you. I, you just speaking about the Nano 5 and stuff like that. Um, I have a, several uh, sites in Buffalo, and we're using um, Ubiquity products in several of those sites. And most of them, luckily for me, are line of sight, so I can shoot back and forth, you know, you know, a few hundred yards or so. But I have a, uh, a new site that I want to put online, and it's a little further out. None of these sites are like two stories high and I have trees and stuff in the way. How do you get around the geographical situation when you're trying to do 
multiple sites together and you don't want to do it through the net, internet. Sure. So two ways that you can do that. Uh, number one is to stick with line of sight and like dog leg around a building or dog leg around the trees, basically have like sort of a multi um, set of, uh, you know, access points that sort of shoot around any obstructions. That's sort of one way. And that's the way that you'd have to do it if you want to maintain a lot of speed. The other way you do it is you drop the band that you're using, right? So typically when we're talking about the nano stations, the nano beams, you've got AC at the top, then five gigahertz, which those are basically about the same. Then below that, you've got 2.4 gigahertz, and below that, you've got 900 megahertz. Okay, so the difference is the lower you go, right, so all the way down to 900 megahertz, the better penetration you're going to get through obstacles such as trees and buildings. The higher you go, the faster you go, right? So basically, it's like a graph where higher up, is you know in the five gigahertz spectrum you get really good speeds but you don't get the distance and you don't get the penetration you don't you, you have to have line of sight or it's not going to connect at all when you go down to like 900 megahertz you don't have to have line of sight necessarily you could shoot that like literally through a building and it should still work but your speeds are going to be like less than 100 megabit right so it, it really just depends on if you need a lot of speed, then you're going to have to dogleg around the obstructions and find a way to do line of sight. If the speed it doesn't well, matter as going, much, then you just go with like yeah, 900 crossing, meters. Crossing the town is what I'm trying to do. You know, not uh, more than a few city blocks, almost like two or three miles trying to get through the town. So doglegging around is, is not practical because I don't own the, so many different properties sure. to do that. So, um, if I tried to do something with 900 megahertz, what would you suggest? Does Ubiquity have something that would specifically target 900 megahertz? Yeah, let's take a look. So we're going to go to ubnt.com. We're going to click on products. Oh, let me switch to this view where you guys can actually see what I'm looking at here. Okay, so we're going to click on products. Uh, I'm going to click on air fiber. And I don't even know if they still have this stuff out there. No, it doesn't look like they do. Air fiber antennas. Am I looking for air fiber? Air Max. Excuse me. Air Max. Um, so Air Max, you're going to have... I, they might not have the 900 megahertz stuff out here. So they've got this like Yagi antenna. Uh, but you're basically going to want the Rocket M9. Okay, so it's a rock, uh, that's the, the 900 megahertz Rocket uh, antenna. And then you're going to either want to go with this Yagi antenna, which is more of a point-to-point. -point. So you can see here long range deployments of 900 megahertz and related products is the Rocket M. There it is right here. Let me open that in a new tab so we can look at that next. Um, but this says, so right here, you see it going through trees. Air Max Yagi antenna mm -hmm. performs at ultra long ranges in non line of sight applications. Um, let's see what the data sheet says. I'm trying to figure out exactly what it's sort of spec for here. Okay, here it is. It features incredible range performance for up to 20 plus kilometers and speeds of up to 90 plus megabits. So the further out you go, the lower your speeds are going to be. But that's sort of what you want. And by the way, keep in mind that that Yagi antenna is freaking huge. It's like four feet long. It's like, it's gigantic. Um, oh, wow. So just be, be wary of that. They also make a 900 megahertz sector antenna for point to multi-point, which might also still work if you are, you know, um, just using it for point to point, but you're not going that far. Like how far did you say? Two to three miles? Yeah, two to three miles. And you're looking for point to point or point to multi-point? I, I would go point to point. Uh, it'd be nice to do multi-point, but uh, that's not in the game right now because they're in different directions. Yeah, so, so basically um, you'd want probably, the best solution would be this Yagi antenna with a Rocket M9 and then uh, but, you know one on each side basically. Or actually on the receiving side, you probably don't even need this. Um, you probably don't even need, uh, the station side doesn't need to be the Yagi. It could be, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. I think they make a, a, nine, a 900 megahertz dish antenna. Uh, let's see if I can find a nine. I wish they had like a filter here where I could just filter down on 900 megahertz. Um, but like here's the, oh, here's the Air Max sector antenna for 900 megahertz. And if you're not actually watching the screen, you can go back and look at this later. Um, 
but it's one of these guys. I think it's this uh, big guy here. And then, let's see, Power Beam AC. I know they have a dish for 900 megahertz somewhere. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. It might not be on their website. Wouldn't a dish be more line of sight, though? Say that again? Wouldn't a dish be more line of sight, though? So it doesn't matter the form factor of the antenna. It matters the, the um, spectrum that you're using. Right, so 900 okay. megahertz. It, it, it's not like if you have a sector antenna versus the Yagi antenna, one is going to get better penetration through trees. It's just the fact that it's 900 megahertz that, get, that gets you that penetration through trees. Okay. So here you have the M900, the Rocket M900. And this is what we use when we do have to go through trees or buildings. Um, it, again, it's it's a lot slower. So you, hear, you see uh, down here, model comparison, M900 is only up to 150 megabits. It'll actually probably be closer to like 80 or 90 when you actually implement it. Um, but that will get you the penetration through trees. They also have this Nano Bridge M, um, which works, I believe, with the M900. Let's see. Yeah, there's a Nano Bridge M9, which is a super long range one, I guess, but this is also can be used for point to uh, point to point stuff too. So th again, there's a lot of options as far as antennas and antenna configurations and access point configurations. But the important thing is if you don't have line of sight, you got to go 900 megahertz. All right. You think that would also go penetrate like small buildings if, if there was a building in the way? Probably. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, right. I wouldn't like put it through like multiple multiple buildings <laughs> like you wouldn't want to run it through a right. whole neighborhood but uh right. i think it would probably you know do okay through some buildings yeah Th again get it up as high as you can on both sides so that you're eliminating as Absolutely. much of that as possible but uh yeah it has a lot of um uh, uh, it can pass through more than you would think it could excellent thank you very much for your help i appreciate it and uh you have a good night. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, have fun in Istanbul, Turkey. All right. Okay. That was fun. I like those questions. And actually, I'm, I, I have a uh, video series planned. Um, I don't know when. I just I have it on my to-do list. I have this list of videos I want to do like a mile long <laughs> sitting next to me. And one of the things on that list of videos is basically, um, you know, how to start a really cheap wireless ISP. And as part of that, I would explain the difference between 900 megahertz, 2.4, 5 gigahertz, and AC. And uh, so let me guys, let me know in the comments if that's something that you guys would be interested in viewing. And I will uh, make that more of a priority. Okay, so Michael Kidd says, Yay, I picked up a pre-release NS5ACL and was saddened that it couldn't connect to normal 802.11 AC access points restricted to AirMax only. Is it? I think I have the Nano. Which one do I have? I have. I did a video on the Nano Station ACs. I'm not sure if that's the exact same one that you're referring to, um, but I actually didn't. I don't believe I tested the Nano Station AC directly with like clients. I know the old Nano Stations. You could set them up as basically like a repeater. Um, you could set it up as like essentially an access point for. You know, you could connect your phones directly to it and stuff like that, but they weren't, they just weren't great antennas for that. There's much better ways to do that. Um, so, yeah. All right, let me put this back on the phone calls. If you guys have any phone calls, if you want to talk to me, if you have questions, these have all been wonderful questions so far. Um, so, yeah, this is the perfect type of thing that I was looking to hope for or that I was hoping to answer. And uh, I will keep going as long as the phone calls uh, keep rolling in. Okay, so let's see. Uh, Cashy, don't spam the comments, man. Uh, I will answer your question, but you don't need to spam it over and over. Uh, hey, how can we get good signals in bridge connection on UBNT AirMax light beam antenna? Please guide. So I did a full point to multi point video using the light beam AC. So go back through my um, past videos and just search for light beam AC or search for point to multi point and you'll see a ton of videos. I probably have like easily two hours worth of videos you could watch on that subject. Okay, we got another call coming in. Let me go ahead and answer this call. This is from the 908 area code. Welcome to the channel. Who are you and what can I do for you? I'm Matt from New Jersey. Hi. Hey, Matt. Um, first, I want to say thank you. I love your videos. 
Cool. There. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They really helped me pick up a lot of ubiquity stuff. Wonderful. Um, and uh, starting to use it more and more. Um, I had a question. I'm uh, starting to try to. Uh, I have a, a few situations where I, I go into, say, a venue or something, um, and I need to uh, connect my uh, network. I do uh, small theater stuff, so we have con- networks for show control. Okay. okay. Um, and I need to connect that up to the Internet. Sometimes the venue only has Wi-Fi. And I'd like to see if there's any Ubiquity products or anything that would allow me to kind of catch that Wi-Fi signal. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, essentially let me put it in as, as the input, like a WAN port um, into my network. Yeah, absolutely. So you can, uh, the first thing you have to know or try to figure out is what is the spectrum of the Wi-Fi at the venue, right? So is it 5 gigahertz? Is it 2.5 gigahertz? It's sometimes one, sometimes the other. <laughs> yeah, the 2.4 that, or whatever. That's yeah. the thing that I was looking for. <laughs> so um, once you know the spectrum that you can try to, you know, sort of, you know, grab onto. Um, I, it's funny that you mentioned that because I did a video a long time ago called, and the mistake I made was calling the video, How to Steal Your Neighbor's Wi-Fi. And yeah, in that I video, that. I gone. used a NanoStation M5 and I grabbed a 5 gigahertz wireless signal with that NanoStation. And then I made the NanoStation a router that routed that into a separate network and you can do whatever you want with it. So that is literally exactly what you're trying to do. And it is possible with the NanoStation devices. Um, So what I would do is if you have a traveling kit where you're setting this stuff up and you need to grab onto that Wi-Fi, bring a NanoStation M2 and bring a NanoStation M5. And then that should should cover the bases. There's no device that does both 2.4 and 5? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. All right. Well, cool. Thanks for the help. Yeah, no problem. And have a good one. Same to you. All right. Bye. bye. Okay, there we go. So yeah, that video that video was pretty funny because uh, I still I literally still get asked about that on a pretty regular basis. Someone just tweeted me about that video this week. Um, they retweeted one of my very old tweets where I first announced that video, and they said, "Hey, whatever happened to this video?" And uh, yeah, it's just it's just gone. I had I got it got taken down. I got banned from live streaming for three months because of that. It was a mess. So I am very careful uh, to not put out those clickbaity type uh, titles anymore. Okay, Computer Wiz says, just wanted to give thanks for your expertise. I've watched a few of your videos, very knowledgeable and thorough. Thanks again. Well, thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Uh, your equipment recommendations to backhaul a two gig circuit 10 miles. Wow, that is gnarly. Two gigs, I don't know if you can, well, let's take a look at what they have here. So you'd, you'd be looking at air fiber. We got another call coming in from 631. I will pick you up in just a second here. Uh, but let's answer this air fiber question first. So air fiber, uh, see, so, oh, here's one that's two gigabit per second. So the air fiber 24 HD, let's take a look at this product. 20 plus kilometers and you're going 10 miles. So I think that's within 20 kilometers. I'm not good on my kilometers to miles math. Um, but up to two gigabits per second. So this is what you would want is something like this, or of course there are a lot of other manufacturers out there such as Cambium Networks that make similar products um, to get you out there. But yeah, look at this one. Air Fiber 24 HD is in the 24 gigahertz spectrum, which I believe you would have to be licensed for. Maybe someone can answer that in the chat. I don't know if that's a licensed spectrum or not. Uh, two gigabit of throughput, 20 plus kilometers of range. But man, I bet that thing is a bitch to line up <laughs> to actually get that thing lined up. Oh, we had a caller, but they dropped off. So I'll just keep uh, answering uh, questions here. Okay, Evan M asks, wanting to learn free PBX in my lab environment. Uh, let me bring this chat over so the people watching this later can see it. Um, where was that? Wanting to learn free PBX in my lab environment, what kind of hard phone would you recommend to learn on? Not looking for anything too expensive, just looking to start learning the free PBX system. So the one that I would recommend, uh, relatively inexpensive, but a good solid phone that's going to have all of the features that you want to play with is the Sangoma S400. Okay, so let's go to crosstalksolutions.com. I will show you exactly the phone that I would recommend. 
go to Crosstalk Store, click on Phones, and then we've got the S400. So they have the S400, which is 99 bucks, and then they have the S500. You can go no power adapter for 99 bucks, and then they have the S405, excuse me, that is this exact same phone, but it has gigabit pass-through instead of 10100 pass-through. Okay, so that's the phone that I would recommend if you're just learning, less than 100 bucks, and really solid phone with all the features that you want. Okay, whoop, call ended. Oh, hang on a second. I got another call coming through here. All right, caller from the 631 area code. How are you doing? Uh, who are you and what can I do for you? Hi there, I'm uh, Nick. I'm calling from Enschede, the Netherlands. All oh, right, uh, Netherlands, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I had a quick question. Uh, I set up my uh, home network with a uh, USG and a uh, AP uh, LR access point, and I saw some people setting up uh, different VLANs for their IoT devices. What are your thoughts on that? Um, Is it really necessary I, or? Yeah, I mean, listen. In a home environment, if your network is secure, you have very strong WPA passwords and that sort of stuff. There's probably not a super need to have um, the IoT devices segregated. The reason that people recommend segregating IoT devices is for security, right? So we've seen a lot of these horror stories where like smart light bulbs are used to DDoS attack you know, other, <laughs> other, uh, you know, websites right. and, and things <laughs> like that. Or, or like they, there might be some exploit in your IOT device that allows you to, um, compromise other things in your network, right? So someone might be able to sort of reverse into, you know, reverse tunnel into your network and then get to like your windows computer or something like that. Right. So that's really the danger. Um, so what you have okay. to do is look at the IOT devices that you have in your network figure out which are the ones that are phoning home and which are the ones that are just staying local to your network, right? So I would separate those into two separate categories. And if you have a lot of devices that are phoning home or like, like a Nest camera that uses the central cloud portal in order to view the streams and stuff like that, those are the ones that are, in, that are more susceptible to compromise because they are actually creating a connection out to the internet, right? So. You just look at what you have, okay. and if you think there's sufficient, if there's sufficient reason to put them in their own separate network, then I would say go for it. Now, the downside to putting IoT devices in their own network is that, depending on the IoT device, it can make them more difficult to work with. So for instance, like a Google Chromecast, right? If you take a Google Chromecast and you plug that into a separate IoT network, you now have to do some special stuff in the firewall to allow you to cast from your phone or from your computer to that Google Chromecast, right? And a lot of people aren't gonna really have the know-how to be able to do that. So again, it's risk versus reward. Uh, if you add more security and put your stuff into their own VLAN, you're making it more of a pain in the ass for yourself when you're trying to actually use those devices, right? So security versus usability, and there's going to be some, um, you know, some middle ground there that's going to be the right answer for you. Yeah, yeah, I actually experienced what you just said firsthand. I put my uh, Chromecast and Google Home in, in a separate VLAN and saw that I couldn't cast anymore and right. uh, uh, stream music to it. Uh, so that's why I really asked the question. Um, I guess I have to figure out what what the, those devices are really doing on the on the network because I don't know yet, but I can easily figure that out by making a packet captures or whatever. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for your help and and keep up the great videos. All right, Nick, well, thanks so much and thanks for calling in. First caller from the Netherlands. Yeah. I absolutely appreciate that. Uh, someone asked. Uh, Robert Coleman asks in the chat here. Let me. Oh, I am on my chat screen. Uh, what, how do you feel about putting Chromecast in with your PC VLAN? Um, personally, I'm okay with it because I'm confident in the secure security of my own network. Uh, but I also, I have a Chromecast, but I don't use it. <laughs> I have, uh, like Roku's and Apple TVs on all of my TVs. Uh, Ian writes, what soft phone are you using for the live stream? And I don't want to bring it over because I don't want to accidentally display anyone's phone number but I am currently using the Counterpath Bria 4 for this live stream, uh, as the phone for this live stream. But 
Um, what I'm doing with it, which is basically just taking calls and you know pumping the audio through my desktop audio, that is possible to do with you know any soft phone. It should be anyways. Um, like for instance, when I was testing it out yesterday and seeing if I could actually pull off a live stream where I was taking phone calls, um, I did it with the Counterpath X Lite, which is a free soft phone. So why did I switch back to Bria? I don't know, because I paid for the license, I might as well use it. Um, okay, so no one is lined up for phone calls right now, so let's see if we can take some people's questions here. Okay, how it ends about the issue with Nanostation AC. You got very low speeds when making the video and you said you were solving this with the Ubiquity people. So I did get low speeds with the Nanostation AC. That, I never actually resolved that, so it, it really depends on the way that you look at it. Because we say low speeds. Oh, can you guys hear that? Someone's calling me on my, <laughs> hang on one second. Someone's calling my Google Voice number. Get out of here with your Google Voice. I wish I could, I should really disable that. I, I don't use Google Voice anymore. Um, so with the Nanostation AC, so like, here's the thing. You go to products, we look at Air Max, we look at the Nanostation AC, and they advertise, uh, da, 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 this is the model that I had, and they advertise 450 plus megabits per second for the Nanostation AC. And in my testing, I was unable to get it over 85 megabits per second. I think it was like 85, 90 megabits per second in my test. Now, why is that? And so a couple of reasons. Number one, the 450 megabits is total throughput, but keep in mind that these nano stations are not full duplex, okay? So they're sending and receiving separately. So immediately, oh yes, can you show us on the screen? I'm sorry, guys, I always screw that up, don't I? There we go. So here's the Nanostation 5AC. This is the one that I was testing with, 450 megabits per second. In fact, let me zoom that up a little bit because it's kind of hard to see. So first of all, it's, it's not full duplex. So when I was getting 85 megabits up and down, technically, according to the way that Ubiquity measures things, I was getting 170 gigabits, uh, excuse me, 170 megabits worth of throughput that still falls well short of the 450 plus megabits that this thing promises. So where, wh how do we make up that gap? Well, number one, there's two things. Well, there's two things. Number one, I was testing them very close together and there is supposedly some optimum range. Um, you know, from here, from this pole outside my window to the tree where I was testing is no more than like 50 or 60 feet. And if you have them spread apart by like 500 yards, you might be able to get better throughput because they're just not made to work that close to each other. The second thing is I was only a single client, okay? So if I had multiple client streams that was testing, doing speed tests simultaneously, I probably could have gotten up over the 85, 90 megabits that I was getting because I think it's, it, it matters how many clients are actually working with it. Um, so basically, if you were in a perfect environment and you had the perfect number of clients, you might be able to receive 450 megabits per second, which is actually 225 megabits per second up and 225 megabits per second down since it's not full duplex. So hopefully that answers that question. And uh, I, I've, I've done a lot of thinking about how I could possibly figure out a way to have a real world test that's a lot further apart. Um, and I hope to someday be able to come up with something <laughs> that I can actually test these things further apart in the real world with like good line of sight uh, across like a mile or longer. Uh, but again, I just haven't come up with a way to do that yet. Okay, so nanostation versus nano beam. That's, uh, I think it just has to do with the, um, the beam width. So a nano beam is a much narrower beam width, whereas a nano station is a little bit wider. I don't know specifically the degrees. I, I want to say like a nano beam is like a six to 10 degree antenna and the nano station is like a 15 to 25 degree antenna or something like that. Maybe you guys know for sure. I, I, I again, th that's just me talking off the top of my head. I could be completely wrong about that. So what point to point can I get that is full duplex? 
they do exist. Uh, they do exist. I know Cambium has some full duplex point to point. I think Cambium's point to point 550 is full duplex. Let me let's check them out. Cambium Networks uh, products. Let's see if we want to search for the PTP 550. No, I just want to search on the page. No, no, no. Search on the page. 550. Oh, there it is. PTP 550. So this thing comes either connectorized, where it has a uh, antenna attached to it, or uh, or where you can actually use the I forget what those connectors are, but you can put, plug your own antenna up to this too. Um, point to point gigabit plus capacity. So PTP 550 is a point to point gigabit throughput solution based on 802.11 wave C wave C uh, wave C wave two. 802.11 AC Wave 2 operating in the 5 gigahertz wireless space, addressing the gigabit capacity needs for high-speed backhaul solutions in short-range and middle-range applications, provides up to 1.3 gigabits of throughput with ARC. I don't know what ARC is. What's ARC? And asymmetric non-contiguous channel aggregation across the 5 gigahertz band. The way that I understand that they are pulling off uh, almost 1.4 gigabits point to point with this thing is they're using two 80 megahertz channels in in you know together at the same time which is gnarly like no one's you're not you're gonna have to find like you would have to have no other radio interference in anywhere close to you to be able to use two 80 megahertz channels but it is really cool that it can actually do that so let's see uh yeah so channel sizes dual independent channels each channel is configurable as 20, 40, or 80 megahertz. So basically they're doing like 700 or 650 megabits per second per 80 megahertz channel. And there's two of them, uh, two independent channels or you know radios inside this, uh, this device. It doesn't say if it's full duplex or not though. Yeah, I don't know if this is actually full duplex or not. Or maybe maybe I'm just reading it wrong. I, I don't know as much about this stuff. I usually rely on uh, my guy Brandon to handle this sort of stuff. So he's much better at uh, understanding these radios than I am. But hopefully that answers your question. All right, Hugo writes, how is your Tesla 3 holding up? Love the videos, especially the one with the wall connector comparison. Man, I got flamed like crazy because of that wall connector video. Uh, because uh, I'm not an electrician. <laughs> and I kept calling it the NEMA 1540 plug uh, when in reality it's a NEMA 1450 that I had installed. And so, man, I got I got so flamed for that. But that video has like 22,000 views or something. So people were really, really interested in that subject. So, uh, okay, so let's see. Oh, ARC is an error control mechanism. Oh, thank you for that. Okay, do you plan on doing a video on the new Unify controller? They have, uh, they seem to have changed quite a bit. Yes, I will. I'm actually, so you're talking about like, I think it's 5.9.29 is the latest version. Um, I, that currently only runs on cloud keys. So I'm trying to get my hands on a couple of the Gen 2 cloud keys. I want one of each. I want the regular Gen 2 cloud key and I want a cloud key plus so that I can start doing videos on those. Um, when I get my hands on those devices, I will absolutely do videos on the 5.9 Unify for sure. Okay, uh, Rob writes, building a new home and planning on using all Ubiquity products for network and security. I'm sure you're aware this could be quite costly. In your opinion, is it worth it? Um, I mean, here's the thing, right? It, what's, your, what's your wireless worth to you? How important is it that you have good wireless coverage for your 4,200 square foot home, right? Uh, and by the way, I don't know where you live, but in most places, a 4,200 square foot home is going to be quite an expensive property, right? So, uh, you know, listen, you can probably afford to spend a little bit more than, you, than going to Best Buy and buying a, uh, you know, one of those like eight antenna, you know, Night Ranger, whatever the hell they're called things. I call them, I call them the Wi-Fi spiders. Um, 
So yeah, is it worth it? I think so. And honestly, it's not that expensive. So, oh, here, in the design, 124 port PoE switch, three AC pros, one in-wall AP, three GP pro cameras, one micro blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah, I think that's a. F I think that's fine. Um, three AC Pros. The only thing you might consider is going with the Nano HD instead of the Pro. It's going to give you a little bit better throughput, but uh, you know, probably not noticeable. Yeah, I think that's a perfect setup, and I don't think that the price is that expensive, um, especially with if you get that Cloud Key Pro Gen Two. That's gonna. I mean, that's like really good hardware running on. Uh, or, or I should say it's, it's powerful hardware and it, and the fact that it can be your NVR and your unified controller is really cool. Just take backups. Okay. Cause I don't know. I don't trust the cloud keys. I know the gen two cloud keys have some level of battery backup inside of them, but I still don't trust it. Always, 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 always take good backups. Okay. So let's see. Uh, 5.2.29 running on a mini PC with Ubuntu. Okay. So any comments on the new alpha version of free PBX 15 that was mentioned in Astrocon? Yeah, I got a comment on that. Every time I start doing a new free PBX series, they come out with the next version. <laughs> so I think I should, uh, I think I should just start doing a version 15 free PBX series and they'll come out with version 16 a lot quicker. Um, honestly though, no, there's a couple of new things that they've talked about for a long time. So the version 15 brings um, a lot of really cool features. The two main features that I am personally most impressed with is that they have a fully functional API now built into FreePBX, and it is wonderful. They showed a demo of it, not this past year at Astrocon, but the year before when they were just like FreePBX 15 was just alpha. They showed a demo of the API, um, and it's phenomenal what you can do with it. So I think free PBX 15 really takes a gigantic leap forward in terms of interoperability between free PBX and other products. Uh, we have a call coming in from anonymous. I don't know how I feel about taking anonymous calls. Maybe, maybe I'll, maybe I'll pick it up in a second. We'll see. Um, the second thing that free PBX 15 brings in is the ability to now back up and restore. So they basically made all of the different modules within FreePBX their own little tiny backup set. So each little module has its own backup settings. When you back up FreePBX 15, you're backing up a whole bunch of small individual backups that are combined into one versus right now you get one big glob of every configuration setting in FreePBX. Now, since they were able to sort of separate that out and make backups um, more efficient, they now have the ability to backup and restore cross version. I think it's all the way back to free PBX 11, if I'm not mistaken. So you can now backup free PBX 11 and restore it to free PBX 15, or you can backup free PBX you know, 14 and restore it to free PBX 15. So that is really awesome. And that is going to help tremendously. Now, full disclosure, I have not tested that. Okay. So that's what they claim. And uh, I hope it works as well as they claim, but I have not tested it personally. So I do not have experience with it. But like, for instance, there's a free PBX 13 to 14 upgrade tool that I never use because it just, it's blown up on me too many times. Um, so yeah, there's that. Uh, did they release a wallboard feature yet? I feel like they did just release a wallboard feature. Hang on, Armando. Let me check that out for you. Freepbx.org. Let's see if they did get a, see if we have a wallboard feature. Uh, community, we want to uh, store commercial modules, CRM, call center builder. I don't recall if there is a wall board. I feel like I saw something about it, but maybe I am incorrect. Now, I don't see anything about a wall board unless they built it into, um, you know, the queues, uh, exact view, whatever that is, exact view reports or something. Exact dialer. Oh, I think it's Q's Pro. Yeah. So I just actually literally just checked this out yesterday. They don't have a wallboard 
in the user base control panel yet. But uh, they don't actually have any queue stuff at all in the user base control panel, at least not in version 14. Um, so I will, uh, I I'm hoping that they do come out with a wallboard soon, but there are other options. So you've got queue metrics, you've got um, flash operator panel, which has a wallboard plugin. Also by the makers of Flash Operator Panel, you have Astronic Call Center Stats, which gives you some really great insight into your queues and stuff like that. So, you know, for the most part, we sell um, Flash Operator Panel and Astronic Call Center Stats to customers that have like higher needs as far as queues go. So I hope that answers your question. All right, phone lines are open. 541-283-0651. If you guys have a question, uh, go ahead and bring it on through. Also. I have a question for you guys. Um, how many of you listen to podcasts? Because where's my chat? Where did my chat go? Oh, is it over here? Oh, here it is. Uh, how many of you guys listen to podcasts? Because with this Tesla Model 3 that I've been driving around, love it. I love that car, by the way. I will. I, I don't know. I might never, I might not ever buy another car until, <laughs> until something comes out that's as good as it or better than the Model 3. It's absolutely phenomenal. But in the Model 3, there's uh, LTE connectivity. So you can just go through the dashboard and select whatever podcast you want. So you can just podcast right in the car. You can also do streaming audio through Slacker. And, and of course, you can connect your iPad or your iPod or, or your iPhone, whatever, and listen to stuff that way. Um, so my, uh, my question is for a show like this, like a live stream where I'm taking phone calls and answering questions, would you guys be interested in this, you know, being produced also as a podcast? So as soon as I'm done with the live stream, I would basically upload it as a podcast and then people could listen to it. Is that something that people would be interested in? Um, I... I mean, I don't know if a lot of you guys are going to be interested in it because you're on YouTube watching it. <laughs> so it's it's a little bit different in that you don't get the visuals, like when I'm looking through web pages and talking about stuff. Um, so I might need to, you know, I might need to adjust the way that I present a little bit and not quite be so visual. But I'm thinking that I might, you know, people might be interested in hearing these phone calls and this sort of stuff uh, on a uh, on a podcast. So. Okay, so podcasts on YouTube, but per subject rather than following episodes. Per subject. Hmm. That's interesting. Okay, so uh, Draggy says, Wisp. Here is Wisp with 6,000 clients, and they don't use VLANs for radio management, nor client isolation for easier troubleshooting. Ouch! Is management VLAN needed on radios for security or it's overkill? It's needed. If you have 6,000 clients on your wireless ISP, you should have a management VLAN and you should have all of the security in the world on those things. Because 6,000 people, some percentage of those people are going to be poking around and trying to hack your, your stuff to try to get better speeds or free service or whatever. So yeah, uh, you really do need to to protect yourself. And, and there is, again, in IT, I've always said this, but if you ask 10 IT guys how to do something, you're going to get 11 different answers, right? But that being said, there are right and wrong ways to do things. There's a lot of right ways to do something that'll get you the same goal, the same end goal. You can accomplish the same thing, but there's a lot of wrong ways to do things also. And, uh, and certainly um, not setting up proper security, proper routing, and proper inter-VLAN management of a wireless ISP with 6,000 clients is a big, big problem. That's, uh, you know, to me, it's uh, akin to um, like not having a firewall. You know what I mean? It's like, it's that, it's like that serious of a problem. Okay. Oh, here's an anonymous call. Let's take this anonymous call and see if we, uh, this is like, this is like roulette here. Let's see what happens. Hello, anonymous. What can I do for you? Hey, hey Chris, this is Hugo Hernandez calling from South America. How you doing, man? Hey, Hugo. Yo, Hugo, for those who have not, uh, are not familiar, Hugo is a longtime fan of the show, the channel. He's on every live stream. He comments on a lot of videos. Hey, Hugo, it's great to talk to you in person, man. 
Hey man, yeah, it's, it's it's nice talking to you and all the all the community out there, man. So just Excellent. love the videos and and I'm also a huge you know network admin and uh, man, I learned a lot from you guys, from you and also from Willie and Tom and I mean uh, I've been in IT for almost uh, like 20, 20 years. Wonderful. And man, I, and whatever whatever anything comes new, I. I Thank a lot of you, uh, especially you and Willie and all the other guys who put those efforts with uh, with the videos and especially with the with the free PBX stuff and the ubiquitous stuff. Man, I learned a lot. I just wanted to call in to say a big thank you personally for all the efforts that you do you do for us out out here. Oh, very cool. And uh, you got any uh, got any questions for me while you're on the line here? Uh yeah. Uh so um yeah, something about uh the you know the the Sangoma um uh you know merger with the with Asterisk mm -hmm. with with PGM and Asterisk. So I'm not uh, uh I have I know I'm you are you're an, a big uh, um open source advocate and uh you I know you talked to Andrew Nagy on 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 Sangoma and all that stuff. Where do you see uh, the mer uh, the um, development of on asteroids and free PBX moving forward in the next, uh, uh, let's say, uh, with uh, you know, with now the integration with the DGM Sangoma? I know that you did a video on on that, but I mean, on the software side, besides you know, keeping in uh, Sangoma, keeping everything you know open, open source, and you know, the great uh, work that they're doing coming up with uh, new versions of free PBX and PBX Act. Uh, where did you see that partnership going forward? Uh, besides, you know, the software part, the, op the open source press, and, mm -hmm. and also all the acquisitions that were they did with, uh, you know, with the, uh, besides Digium, the other acquisition that they have with the, with the, um, the uh, you know with the getways and all that all that stuff that was going on lately. What is your your what is your point of on uh, view on the future of that partnership? So a uh, great question. Um, and, and of course keep keep in mind that it, take anything that I say with a grain of salt, right? Because I am a big advocate of Sangoma. I make a lot of money selling free PBX systems, selling PB exact systems. So I am fully in Sangoma's camp, right? So just keep that in mind as I answer this question. Um, I, I like where it can go. Okay. So I like that they, um, have the ability to make changes to, um, asterisk, uh, maybe, or, or at least are prioritized, um, for the changes that free PBX and PB exact need in asterisk. Uh, but keep in mind that asterisk is its own group, right? And so basically asterisk is an open source development group and, they have clients just like anyone else. Their main client for a long, long time was Digium. Okay, Digium owned the the Asterisk open source project. And so everyone that worked for mm -hmm. Asterisk, their client was Digium, but of course they got super high priority because Digium owns them, right? Or, or I should say owns the copyright to that mm -hmm. product. Now Sangoma owns them, okay? But Sangoma is still going to be their quote unquote client, right? So they will be... Yep. Um, hopefully prioritizing Sangoma stuff. And there's a lot of stuff that, you know, I'm sure Sangoma wants to get done that maybe they weren't able to get done previously because they didn't have the the sort of pool, the ownership um, of that actual project or that copyright. So mm -hmm. I, I think that there's a lot of stuff that can go well for Sangoma. However, I would be very surprised if we did not see a phase out of Digium stuff over the years. Um, I don't think it'll happen quickly, but for instance, the Digium phones, I've never been a big fan of the Digium phones because I feel mm. like they're too expensive. Yeah. Um, so I can yeah, see yeah, perhaps they that are. they would they would start combining the phones into perhaps only Sangoma phones. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that happen. Even yeah. though mm -hmm. they did just announce, um, I think it was a week or two ago, just prior to Astrocon, they announced that you like just like Sangoma phones, where if you install a Sangoma phone and you're using free PBX, you don't have to pay for the phone apps or endpoint manager license. Yeah. So 
They just yeah. extended that mm-hmm. now to Digium phones as well. If you have Digium phones on free PBX, you yeah. do not have to pay for the licensing mm-hmm. for Endpoint Manager or, yeah. um, you know, so that that's promising, right? That's a promising change that they made. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like, what about yeah, their promising. what about their mm-hmm. TDM cards? You know, what about um, the stuff where mm-hmm. there is literally a direct overlap? Like they make a single port Sangoma PRI card and they make a single port Digium PRI card. Right. So wh- what's going to happen there? Right. You know, like the, I imagine that there will be some combining of product line as we move forward. The one that I. Yeah, that, that's yeah. That, and that's the natural all of our things when you do when you do merges, so you, you have to stream streamline the production to, you know, to. Try, try to, you know, not to reduce, but try to make everything compatible sure. within, uh, with the takeover that you do. And it's, it's just great, man. The, the thing that they are doing with, with Sangoma. And I also, I forgot to mention, thank you very much for all the training material that we put up for Sangoma, man. That yeah. helped me a lot. Oh, uh, cool. the, 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 tra- the official course, man, I, I wrote on Facebook. Facebook and I wrote on Twitter, man. You got you rock, man. You you just nail it and make it easy for us to you know to learn and get you know get your, your first step uh, with the certification on the Sangoma products, especially the the PBX and the and the gateways videos. Those were great, and yeah. the, the the one that you did on the SBCs, man. You nail it. You nail it perfectly. I thank you very much. Already I already have my certifications because of you, man. That you nail it. It's cool. Great. Oh, thanks. Well, Hugo, I appreciate that, man. Thank you so much for calling, and I uh, hope you call in again, man. Thanks a lot. You're, you're welcome, man. Hey, keep keep going, and uh, I'll, 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 I'll be, you know, we're waiting on the channel and still commenting, and you keep the good uh, work, man, okay? I appreciate it, Hugo. Have a good one, man. You too, man. Okay, cheers. Bye now. All right, so what Hugo is referring to, by the way, and there's another call coming in from 818. You are going to be next. Thank you for holding. He's been holding for about a minute and a half. Um, what Hugo is referring to there is uh, I do the videos. If you go to, I think it's partner.sangoma.com or the Sangoma Partner Portal, if you log in, I do all of their internal or sort of their partner training videos. So I have full courses on PB Exact start to finish, Vega Gateway start to finish, and Sangoma SBCs start to finish. So you guys can get certified in all of those. It's free, it's online with Sangoma. If you guys are interested in learning phone stuff, phone system stuff, it's a great place to start. Okay, so let's go ahead and pick up this call as soon as it comes in again. Sorry, my uh, hue wrapped around, there we go. Okay, 818 area code, how you doing? Uh, What's your name and uh, and what, what can I do for you? Hey, my name's Dan, calling from sunny Santa Monica, California. How you hey, doing? Hey, Dan. Oh, um, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm just wondering how you guys feel or how you feel about. Um, I use Ubiquity, and I have a client that um, is really concerned about security because of the type of space they're in. Uh, they, uh, you know, have a, a lot of folks um, that they're worried about sort of getting into their system, and so we we do have a security camera appliance that we want to put on their network. And I'm kind of debating, you know, a VPN versus DNS, uh, you know, versus just opening a port and some of those things that I can do to mitigate, you know, the least security risk for them. Um, and so sure. do you have any best practices on that? So so you, you're interested in implementing a an NVR and you want to open it up so that it can be viewed from the outside world? Correct. Yeah, so there, inherently that's going to be insecure, right? Because, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a really tough question. I, let me ask you this. I'll, I will further qualify it. Are people going to be viewing those cameras remotely from a fixed known location? Or do they want to view those cameras from like their cell phone? That's for a security director of this particular organization and so usually he's within the you know the network and and his computer we have set up on a certain vlan um so only he and a couple other people there are able to access it you know it's not even open to other 
other users on the the network. But yeah, he wants to be able to, you know, do this from home or, you know, if there's an issue, you know, let's say and he's not in the office, he wants to be able to quickly access those and not just view them but actually have, you know, some management over them. So just trying to debate, you know, what the most secure way is of doing this without not exposing them to too much risk. Sure. So uh, I don't know if you're looking at the chat here, but his love army brings up a really good point in that you don't have to open up any ports through if you're using the cloud managed access. Um, so basically in the Unify NVR, you can say, you know, connect to the Unify video cloud, and then you're not opening up ports inbound. The information is being pushed outbound to the cloud oh. and then going from there. Disclaimer, this isn't the Ubiquity NVR. It's another third party. It's another company. Okay, NVR so then system. in that case, um, so, okay, so you've got your good, better, best, right? That's the way to look at security, good, better, best. Uh, so the best solution for that type of thing would be don't open ports to the outside world at all, right? Of course, you know, given everything you've told me so far, that's probably not feasible. So let's move to the next one, right? So the next one, what's the better solution? And the better solution in my mind comprises two different layers of security uh, or two different options as far as security goes. The first option is going to be open the ports through, but lock the ports down to the WAN IP address of the people that are connecting. Okay, so... That's how yeah, cool. we do it in the voice over IP world when we're connecting to SIP providers, right? We, we open it up, we open SIP to the outside world, but we are saying only IP 1.2.3.4 can actually connect on these ports. Yeah, so I might be able to lock it down to just his his home IP address, you know, on his home network or something and say, you can only do this when you're there. Correct. However, right? uh, most yeah. people at home are going to have dynamic IP addresses, right? So right, you right. want to either uh, make sure that they switch to a static IP address at home, which sometimes isn't always available, or just be just be aware that you're probably going to be changing your firewall rules on a regular basis, or sometimes there are firewalls out there, like I think PFSense can do this, that allow you to utilize a FQDN it's like, so only open up ports to this specific FQDN, whatever that IP address resolves to is what is allowed through. So then you could use like a dynamic DNS, um, like a DDNS name to, um, you know, to, to give to them if they have a dynamic IP at home. Yeah, I looked at the dynamic DDS too as well, because that's a feature that um, this security camera system has with NVR. And, and I just thought, you know, I mean, there's only so many security systems out there, and at some point, people are going to figure out what DDNS service they're using, and it feels almost least least secure, right? It almost feels like I should just stick with using, um, you know, the the standard method of just going with the public IP and opening the port. But well, again, but it here's, didn't here's here's the other thing, right? So so if we're still looking at the you know good, better, best, and we're in the better section of security. The other option in that section is to utilize VPN. And I would I would probably strongly recommend that, especially if, if you're talking about someone or, or a client that is security minded as they seem to be, VPN is going to be a much better option. Um, and the problem is, you know, you have to have an extra level of user training for VPN. So they have to understand that in order to connect to this, I have to first fire up a VPN. Or, of course, you could do some sort of like hardware VPN solution between their home firewall and your corporate firewall, um, something like that. But VPN is a much more secure way even than opening ports but locking them down to a WAN IP. Great. Well, that is really, really helpful. I, I, I was trying to stay out of tech support area, and I hope I did a good job. No, I think that's um, fine. Yeah, totally fine. <laughs> yeah, because these are, you know, these are things that we have to be more mindful of, uh, right? Security, and I really like that, uh, you know, the good, better, best, um, just thought. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna write that one down. Cool. That's, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Whereabouts are you in, uh, in Santa Monica? I, uh, I am close to the pier, so I've oh, okay. been following, of course, your your broadband community project. I also own a boat down in Marina del Rey, and uh, you know a bunch of uh, residents and people down in that area are all talking about the project. So I've Neat. definitely been following along. 
uh, with you guys and, uh, you know, eager to see how all that goes. Yeah, I actually just talked to um, one of the guys, that, the head of that project uh, about a month ago just to do a catch up and see where they're see where they're going with everything. And they're they're making some really good strides. So, yeah, definitely keep an eye on them. Uh, check out the Community Broadband Project uh, online. I think it's communitybroadband.la is their website. Um, and, and let me ask you one more question. What do you think? Uh, what are your opinions on the uh, on the bird scooters? Oh, don't even get me going about that. Now, why would you do that? Now we're going to leave this, and I'm going to be irritated. Uh, here's here. Okay, here's my thing. Um, I'm a big fan of you know eco-friendly solutions. I've been in Santa Monica for ten years. Um, you know it. it I mean, side little note, they call it, you know, we're the, the city at Silicon Beach, right? But we have the worst wife. We have the worst cellular coverage uh, in all of Los Angeles. I think Santa Monica has the worst cellular coverage, but I digress um, from all the carriers, by the way, because our neighborhood, our neighborhood groups here are really, really vocal and very strong. Um, and so until we get the microcells and stuff in place, you know, uh, the city has had – they've had a really hard time even getting permits for all of our, our poor cellular carriers. But back to the bird, uh, my thought is that, you know, if they would have – I wish that they would have just been more um, friendly uh, to – I wish they wouldn't have come and just dumped them into the city, you know, and they right. didn't do themselves any favors by doing that, you know. To have, you know, four or five, and like I said, I've been a resident here for 10 years. I'm a young guy. I'm cool. I, I feel like I'm hip, like I'm open to new stuff. But it literally felt like, for a long period of time, it just felt like litter. It literally felt like these scooters were littering the city. And I think it's great. Less Uber rides, right? Less, less ride share and less cars was definitely the case. But there's a, mental, a throwaway mentality, I feel like with these scooters yeah um and it's just part of it's part of the uh the, the challenge of these scooters in general is that people feel like oh i'm just it's just a throwaway thing i'm just gonna use it and then i i'll leave it wherever i want to leave it and it literally just kind of ended up being like litter all over the city so yep. i'm happy that the city of santa monica granted some of these experimental um, you know, programs uh, to some of these other companies, and you know, we'll see where it takes us. Um, have you have you tr have you tried forward. one? No, I refuse. <laughs> I will not. <laughs> just for the, just because, uh, you know, just because I'm, I'm holding out, you know. But uh, you know, it, it's a good thing overall. It, of course, it's a good thing, and I have noticed that um, it has resulted in a lot less cars on the road, which is great. Good. But I don't want to see four or five, you know, birds and different scooters sitting on the corner, you know, hanging out into the street and blocking sidewalks. And then a lot of these guys just ride them on the sidewalks. They don't yep. ride them on the streets where they're supposed to. So. Uh, because again, they came in and they dumped these things into the city, you know, without considering regulations or really anything, just to kind of see what would happen, you know. So it's yeah. interesting. Do I sound like a, do I sound like an old curmudgeon-y guy? No, no. I just like to get everyone's opinion. It's funny because I I was born and raised in L.A. in the in the in the San Fernando Valley, and I moved up here to Oregon about five years ago, five and a half years ago, and before I moved. To Oregon, you know, we would get down to Santa Monica on a pretty regular basis or, you know, down in the city or whatever. And there was nothing like that in when I when I left. And so when I came back, the first time that I really came back to Santa Monica was for that community broadband project uh, this past May. And so I was just shocked. I had no idea that bird scooters, lime scooters were even a thing. And then I showed up and I was like, what the hell are these things all over the place? And you see people get on, getting on, getting off. They just, you know, ditch them wherever they want to ditch them. And uh, yeah, so I, I like uh, I like asking people what their thoughts are. And, and most people that I ask actually don't like them. Uh, and yet, you, like when I was down there, people are riding them everywhere. So there's definitely a lot of people that do like them. Uh, they're just, uh, it's, it's just an interesting change from, from what I'm used to in, in Santa Monica. Yeah, yeah, and I think in San Francisco they've went extreme, which you know the residents up there tend to tend to do, which I think is awesome. And so there's like Instagram pages out there you can follow about how people are uh, doing certain things to these, you know, bird scooters and kind of sharing their thoughts on these bird scooters and then taking pictures. It's <laughs> it's really. <laughs> 
uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's been quite entertaining in some ways. But anyway, thank you for uh, the call. Um, I'm a huge fan and I uh, really appreciate the, uh, the insight into that little challenge there I have. Awesome. Well, good luck with that and thanks for calling. All right, man. Thanks. All right, cheers. All right. That's a fun phone call. Yeah. All right. So let's go back to our, uh, our phone call screen. If you guys want to call in and ask any questions, uh, please go ahead and call anytime. Let's go back to the chat. Uh, so Chris Fellows asks, can you talk about breast, best breast practices, best practices for UBNT video on a unified deployment? Should I build a separate, oops, I missed it. Should I build a separate IP network from the corporate network for video? Um, I, I think it's, I think having video on its own separate VLAN is a really good idea because you can manage who has access to that VLAN and you can you can manage you know what's coming in and out of that VLAN. So I actually am a big fan of utilizing VLANs for any NVR. What I'm not a fan of is having the NVR in your, your corporate or your main network, your main VLAN, and then having all the cameras on their own separate VLAN. I, that doesn't make any sense to me, right? So put the NVR in with the cameras. It just makes your life a lot easier, especially with Unify Video uh, where the cameras are sort of auto-detected. They're not going to auto-detect across VLANs. Um, okay, so let's see. What else we got here? We have our clients on separate VLAN. I know there's a lot of VLAN discussion going on. All right, let's talk to Aaron from the Philippines. I'm using a Rocket Prism 5AC Gen 2 with a 19 dBi sector as the point-to-multipoint base. I have that same exact um, uh, setup sitting here in my closet collecting dust. The question is, which do you prefer to use, mix or pure AC? Distance range is 1.5 miles only. Um, I th it really depends. I mean, if you can go all AC, might as well go all AC. I don't think there's any real like disadvantage to having it mixed mode, but you know, I, if, if it's all brand new stuff, I would go AC, but if you're upgrading to an AC point to point access point into an existing deployment where you already have a lot of five gigahertz non AC stations out there, then you go mix mode, right? Until you can get everyone upgraded. I think that's kind of what mix mode is for, is for that migration path to make that migration path a bit easier to swallow for wireless ISPs that are migrating from five gigahertz to AC. Okay, I hope that uh, I hope that um, makes sense. And uh, let's see why we might almost just be running out of time. Have I been going for about two hours now? Let me check my live stream stats here. Where am I? Uh, I've been going for an hour and forty-two minutes. So um, I'm gonna give it about another ten minutes. If you guys have any additional questions or anyone else wants to call in, now is the time. Uh, in the meantime, let's see. David Hartley says, do you have any experience yet with a cloud key? Let me go back to this view here. Do you have any experience yet with cloud key Gen 2, Gen 2 Plus? If so, thoughts? I do not yet. I have not gotten my hands on those devices yet. I will hopefully soon. Uh, you know, to tell you the truth, I'm waiting on Ubiquity to send me some so that I don't have to pay for them. <laughs> and uh, if they would be kind enough to send me one of each, I would very much appreciate it. I've asked a couple times, uh, but if it goes too long, then I'm just going to go ahead and buy one or I will, I'm sure, buy one through just by virtue of the fact that clients need them. And when I get my hands on them, I will, um, I will absolutely uh, do videos on them. But um, yeah, they... Uh, I've got a closet full of Ubiquity stuff that I've paid for, and I'm just kind of like sick of just buying more Ubiquity stuff just to have it. <laughs> you know, I don't actually have a need for either of the Gen 2 cloud keys, so that's why I'm kind of waiting for, for Ubiquity to just send me a couple. <clears throat> Chris, did you see, the gaming panda says, Chris, did you see where Ubiquity is going with VoIP? Uh, I did not. Did they, are they going somewhere with VoIP? I haven't heard anything about anything new with the Unify VoIP stuff. Uh, Simon says, wow, I started following you at 11,000 subs. Wow, that's awesome, man. And remembered you today when browsing some Unify stuff and you have 83K. What, what TF? <laughs> Good job. Well, thank you, Simon. I appreciate that. Yeah, I am uh, looking forward to uh, hopefully hitting 100,000 uh, by like March or April time frame. I'm Super excited about that. And when I hit 100,000, I'm going to try to do perhaps a decent sized giveaway. 
Irfan, greetings from Pakistan. Irfan, thank you. Irfan is also a longtime fan of the channel. Uh, you know, it's funny, Irfan, when I was in um, Wispapalooza this past um, week or last week, uh, a couple of gentlemen from Pakistan came up and introduced themselves and said that they were fans of the channel uh, all the way from Pakistan in Las Vegas. So I was, I was happy to hear that. I love, uh, I love meeting people. Okay, so let's see. Uh, Brad Woodall, do you have a video about the single sip setup one of the first callers asked about? Do I have a video about that? I don't think I do. So basically like how to put flow route like directly on a phone. Um, I don't have a video on that, but that would make for a good topic. So I will um, I will consider that and put it on my, my list, my long to-do list. All right, one more call coming in. This is from the 618 area code. This is gonna be our last call for the live stream. 618 area code, who are you and what can I do for you? Uh, my name's Jeff, I'm from uh, the St. Louis area. Hey Jeff. And um, I just came on late, so I apologize for that. Uh, dang, work stuff's going on. Well, you gotta put um, your priorities straight. You got YouTube and you got work. Where are your priorities? <laughs> I know, I hear you. Running, <laughs> running my own business. That's a little hard to do sometimes. You don't get as much time off as you'd like, right? Tell me about it. So I have a I have a small office and uh, that's off asked me to do a small VoIP setup. I've never done one for such a smaller office. Most of mine are a little bigger, and they've only got two office personnel and one that'll be off site. Um, I have played with a grand stream like a ucm uh 6102 um don't know if that's the best application the free pbx is even the small one are pretty expensive so they're looking to uh you know not be totally you know that's a pretty expensive setup for just two office people just yeah on that. it is um so I get this question actually on a very regular basis. Uh, by the way, someone was saying that the caller was too loud. I turned him down just a little bit, so you guys should be okay now. Um, so when I, so I like to deal in the ten and above space, right? So ten phones and above, and at that point, it becomes most cost effective for something like free PBX or even for like the Grand Stream if you're into Grand Stream. I personally don't like the Grand Stream stuff, but that's that's just my opinion. Um, for those who are like two, three, four phones, honestly, the sort of Ring Central, Grasshopper, slash Vonage, those types of solutions are actually really viable for that space because, you know, it's like $25, $30 in extension per month. And it doesn't really start to gouge customers until you get above like eight to 10 phones. And then you're kind of paying way too much for those services versus getting an on-premise or even cloud-hosted free PBX or grand stream box or whatever. So my advice to those people, oh, I just realized I spelled career wrong on my, on my thumbnail here. I'm staring at it. It says general discussion. Well, the only thing, Sorry, go I ahead. think <laughs> that's a great solution. And that's something that, that I have thought of. And um, I actually, when I first started with VoIP, those are some of the ones that I played with uh, myself to get started with. But the only reason I was asking this as an on-premise solution is because I set up, a, you know, a camera system for them. They've got, you know, 30 cameras over two buildings. Um, I do their networking work. So, uh, you know, I've kind of done, I'm kind of in that space in all the rest of those pieces. And I hate to go, yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to do that for you. You know, here, I'll outsource that. It's not big enough for me. So I was, you know, that kind of feels bad if you do yeah. that. Well, and here's the thing. So, so that would be my initial argument to that question. I go with just a ring central, go with a grasshopper. However, if you have a client, and again, all clients are different. If you have a client that's like, oh, we can't use those for whatever reason, and we have to have an on-premise box, what I would do for a customer personally is go with the most cost-effective, the most bang-for-your-buck solution. And that, in my opinion because I'm familiar with the Sangoma world, I'm familiar with the free PBX and PB exact world, is going to be the PB exact 25. And so that box, the PB exact 25, uh, I don't remember exactly how much it costs, but it's cheaper than buying the free PBX phone system 40 appliance. And it comes with all of the licensing for free PB, for PB exact. So basically it comes with the ability to use Zulu. It comes with, which is a unified communications application that gets installed on clients' desktops. It has the ability to use the Paging Pro, the you know Parking Pro, all of the commercial modules that you would have to buy all a cart. 
Oh, look, there's uh, Caleb, my guy Caleb. Thank you, Caleb. So this is a $635 server. It's good for up to 25 users. And it uh, has all of the licensing that you would possibly need uh, for a customer of that size. Again, it'll scale with them up to 25 users. So you basically need $635 for the server. If you buy it from us, Crosstalk Solutions, you get no tax, you get free shipping. And uh, then you just need to add however many phones. And you could use something like the S400, which is going to be 99 bucks a phone. So then you've got six, seven, eight, nine hundred and thirty-four dollars for a complete phone system solution with three phones, and you're done. No recurring yep, fees. That's pretty reasonable. Yeah, not too bad. So that's what I would recommend in that space. Uh, you know what? Uh, thank you so much for the call. I'm going to try to squeeze one more caller in here because uh, I see one guy's ha been on hold for four minutes. Thanks for the call. We'll talk to you another time. Okay, last call that we are going to take. This call is coming in from the 706 area code. 706 area code, what's your name? What can I do for you? Hey, Chris. Uh, it's Carter here uh, in a little town, Chatsworth, Georgia. And I was wanting to do, first I want to make or experiment with 3PBX and maybe get a phone before our, we do this. My, my family, we own a company, heating and air company. Okay. And I want to install a PBX system. And they have a fax machine and they love the fax. They don't want to get rid of it. So is there a way to integrate fax with PBX? There is a way to integrate facts with PBX. Uh, however, I typically don't recommend it, right? So when you're dealing with voice over IP, voice over IP is difficult enough without then having to add facts on top of it. So for people that are extremely reliant on a fax machine, I always recommend just run a POTS line into the back of your fax machine. That's gonna be the most solid, most reliable solution that you can possibly do. And what I ask people is, well, how important are your faxes to you? And if the answer is, yeah, they're really important, okay, then you need to run a POTS line into the fax machine. Like, that's all there is to it. Okay, yeah, because there's two phone numbers, okay? There's, we have two phone numbers, mm -hmm. and and the fax number is on one of the phone numbers they use. Okay. And w with voice traffic, too. So it's not an only fax number. It, it, it's combined with voice. Yep. So... That's what I'm concerned about because they but use both of those phone numbers. Like if one they have a caller mm -hmm. coming in with we have charters, so what it will actually actually do is it'll convert, take that person that's on six or that number. I'm not going to say it that number and put it over to the other number. It that's what I want because it's it's weird. It, I don't know how charter does it, but yeah. they. They sort of auto detect a fax on the second line and and shift it through somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. That's so that's what I'm talking about. And that's actually a very very common scenario, right? Having two lines where you've got a main pots line and then you've got a secondary pots line that that serves double duty, right? It's it's a rollover yeah. for the main line for voice and it's also a fax. Okay, so the way that I would say and what what's the speed of your charter connection? Is it decent? It's 100, 100 down, 10 up, I think. Yeah, so that's plenty sufficient for two lines or three lines of voice over IP. That's like overkill, right? You got plenty of bandwidth for voice over IP. Yeah. So what I would recommend is either an on-premise uh, solution like that PB Exact 25 I was just talking about with the last caller or a hosted free PBX solution, which is like free PBX up in the cloud. It'll cost you about 35 bucks a month if you go to freepbxhosting.com. Either of those are viable solutions. And then what you can do is once you're comfortable and you're ready to migrate, you switch over to SIP for the free PBX. So now all of your, your quote unquote main line is now on voice over IP, right? So you port that phone number over, you can have 10 channels of SIP, three channels of SIP, however many you want. So for as many phone calls as you want, there's no more like rollover. It's just one phone number with how many calls can that phone number process. Those are the channels. And then you can disconnect all of your analog lines with Charter except for that fax machine line. So still leave that fax machine line. It's now not doing double duty anymore. It's just a fax machine line, but it has the same number. So people that have that fax number saved, you don't have to change that number. Um, and then just, you know, do it that way. So switch over to voice over IP, 
port your main number to voice over IP on the free PVX, and then leave that POTS line into that fax machine. That's, that's how I would typically set it up. That's how I would recommend that clients set it up. Okay. Yeah, and they're also adding an office to the back or in the back of the other office. They're outside where the, the, uh, the plant, we call it the plant, where we keep all the supplies and stuff. They're adding an office, and I'm actually going to add a couple of uh, a, a Unify access points and also maybe some security cameras. So cool. I hope it goes smoothly. So Yeah, well, just watch, watch those videos. That's what they're there for. <laughs> so hopefully they can help you. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, excellent. All right, well, thank you so much for the Thanks call. For I appreciate the it. Yeah. Thank you, too. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. All right, guys. I think that is going to do it for this live stream. Please tell me what you thought in the comments. I'd love to hear if you guys like this phone call format. I personally really enjoyed that. Uh, one of the things that I find when I do these live streams is that I'm talking so much that my voice is just shot for like the next two days. So I am very thankful for the people that called in because it gave me a chance to rest my voice a little bit in between those calls. Um, but yeah, that's it. Uh, it is Friday. So I hope all of you guys have a really great weekend. And uh, we will see you, hopefully, on another live stream that's going to be sooner than, uh, than two months from now, like my last one. So, okay, guys, let me know what you think in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more videos like this, and if you'd like to see more live streams like this, make sure you are subscribed to Crosstalk Solutions on YouTube. Okay, have a great weekend, everybody. We will see you next time.